what you are seeing on the screen is a dreamlike recreation of a portfolio of photos I took at the Grange in Upper Manhattan on Saturday, January 13th, 2018. The Grange is, as some, and hopefully many of you know, was Alexander Hamilton's home in the final years of his life. It was the home he wanted that he finally built for himself and his family outside of what was then New York City, which was Lower Manhattan. The travel time between his new home and Lower Manhattan, where he had his law offices and he still maintained living quarters, would have been a few hours by horseback. So it was not a trip he made every day. It was not what we would call a daily commute, but he certainly frequently traveled between the two, and there is no doubt that the Grange was where he loved to be. It was where he felt most at home. The reason I was at the Grange on January 13th is that some months earlier, Ran Cholet, founder and president of the Alexander Hamilton Awareness Society, had asked me to come and make a presentation at the Grange as part of the annual January tributes to Alexander Hamilton on the anniversary of his birth on Nevis on January 11th, 1757. I hesitated when Rand asked me. In fact, I think I hesitated for almost two months because to put together an original 30 minute plus presentation was going to take quite a bit of work and I had to come up with a useful, relevant topic to begin with. It was only when I finally developed the idea that I would let Alexander Hamilton himself write my presentation that I decided to agree to do this. What I realized that by taking a selection of Alexander Hamilton's own words that I could produce the best possible presentation about Alexander Hamilton combined with some minimal commentary by me. That still created a problem. Alexander Hamilton writing was voluminous, more so than maybe any other leader in American history, certainly of any of the founders. Um, it consumes almost 30 large volumes. So my first decision was to limit myself to the most personal type of communications, which was his letters. That still created a problem in terms of putting together a presentation. Alexander Hamilton wrote thousands of letters during his lifetime, and a considerable number of those letters went on for pages and pages. They were almost mini books in themselves. So I was also not going to go and read all of Alexander Hamilton's letters. The three sources I used, the first was a classic uh, that is titled A Few of Hamilton's Letters, but includes many more than just a few. It was edited by Gertrude Atherton all the way back in 1903 and has been reprinted ever since on numerous occasions. That was my and is my number one source of the letters that I used. The second source is... The Hamilton Collection, The Wisdom and Writings of the Founding Fathers, edited by Dan Tucker. And the final source I use, which is a recent collection of Hamilton's writings that was published by Joanne Freeman, um, a professor at Yale well known for her involvement with uh, the life of Alexander Hamilton. In those three volumes were hundreds of letters. In a few cases, the letters are duplicated because they're so notable, but for the most part in all three, they selected a different group of letters to include in their volumes. From those three volumes, I started out by selecting 68 letters, which most attracted my attention. 68 letters, of course, were going to be far more than I could possibly read even parts of in this presentation at the Grange. So from those 68 initial selections, I reduced that to 18 of the very best from my perspective. And it was those 18 that were, were going to become my presentation at the Grange, not the entire letters. In a few cases, I do read the entire letter, but for the most part, I take short segments from each letter 
that uh, have a highlight value and use them. In fact, 18 turned out to be too many for this presentation to say to stay within the time limit. And I ultimately used 12 letters in the presentation. In this video, I'm going to go back to my original intent and I'm going to do readings from all 18 of those letters I would have used at the Grange if I could have. First, a few words about the Grange itself. Most of all, we should all be thankful that the Grange still exists. The original building, which Hamilton had built for himself and his family, still exists. What you see today is that building. Over the years, it has been moved a number of times. Most recently, for many years, it was wedged between two other buildings and inconspicuously placed on a street in Upper Harlem. The National Park Service, to their credit, a number of years ago, decided to reposition the Grange, which turned out to be a major project, to move it from where it had been for many years recently and to place it on high ground, not exactly where it was originally, but similar on high ground to where it was initially, where Hamilton and his family had these glorious views of the surrounding area and the Hudson River. So the whole building was moved and, and placed where it now is, and a considerable amount of work was done on the building in moving it to its present location. My disappointment, and I think the disappointment of others that still remains, is that it is not the full recreation that you would see at uh, Washington's Mount Vernon or Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, even after being moved and all this money being spent on the Grange recently, the only part of the interior that is recreated as it was during Hamilton's life is the second floor. The lower floor and the upper floor are being used for other purposes. The lower level is a gift shop, an entryway, a exhibition area, and a place for small lectures, such as the one that I gave on January 13th. The second floor, as you'll see in these photos, is accurately reproduced. The top floor has been turned into offices for the National Park Service, and some of the rooms are just storage space where junk is thrown into. That should not be. I certainly won't be happy, and I hope many other people will not be happy, until the restoration is totally complete and that entire building, the entire Grange, reflects for visitors the building just as it was experienced by Alexander Hamilton and for his family also for many years after Hamilton's death in 1804. Uh, there's certainly enough room on the property, the park area where it has been placed for a complementary building where there could be a very good exhibit space, there could be office space, and there could be a good size lecture space. And I'm hoping, I hope others hope, that that is the ultimate project that still needs to take place to properly reflect the importance of Alexander Hamilton and this building, and especially in the absence to this day of a true national monument to Alexander Hamilton. This is the best we have so far, and it deserves to get the same kind of attention and respect and quality that George Washington's and Thomas Jefferson's homes have received. Now back to the presentation from January the 13th, 2018 at the Grange titled Alexander Hamilton in his own words. At the presentation itself, introduction was by Rand Cholet, who also offered narration during different groups of letters, which I read. Sadly, you will not hear Rand on this video because the original audio was not of a quality to use, so I'm recreating my reading of the letters with a brief introduction to each of them. Of the thousands of letters that Alexander Hamilton wrote, I begin with the first letter we have 
that Alexander Hamilton ever wrote, and I conclude with the very last letter, the very last communications of any kind that he ever wrote before his death. Uh, there is a commonality of character to this first letter and to the last letter that I think makes it a very excellent beginning and an end to this collection. The first letter was written on St. Croix, November 11, 1769, from Alexander Hamilton to his boyhood friend, Edward Stevens. Again, only part of the letter. Ned, my ambition is prevalent so that I condemn the groveling and condition of a clerk or the like to which my fortune condemns me and would willingly risk my life, though not my character, to exalt my station. I am confident, Ned, that my youth excludes me from any hope of immediate preferment, nor do I desire it, but I mean to prepare the way for futuridity. I'm no philosopher, you see, and may be justly said to build castles in the air. My folly makes me ashamed and beg you'll conceal it. Yet, Nettie, we have seen such schemes successful when the projector is constant. I shall conclude saying, I wish there were a war. This next letter was also written on St. Croix by Alexander Hamilton to a Captain William Newton on November 16, 1771. What's important about this letter is not who it goes to or the specifics of the letter. It's two things. It's the quality of his writing skills, even at 14, and that at the age of 14, he was already in a position of high responsibility in a trading company on St. Croix. I'm going to read this letter in its entirety. Here with, I give you all your dispatches and desire all you'll proceed immediately to Curacao. You are to deliver your cargo there to Telemann Kruger Esquire, agreeable to your bill of lading, whose directions you must follow in every respect concerning the disposal of your vessel after your arrival. You know it is intended that you shall go from thence to the main for a load of mules, and I must beg if you do, you'll be very choice in quality of your mules and bring as many as your vessel can conveniently contain. By all means, take in a large supply of provendor. Remember, you are to make three trips this season, and unless you are very diligent, you will be too late as our crops will be early in. Take care to avoid the Guadro Costos. I place an entire reliance upon the prudence of your conduct, your very humble servant, Alexander Hamilton. This next letter, the third and final from St. Croix that I am reading and did read on January 13th is Hamilton's famous hurricane letter. Uh, first written to his father, James Hamilton, on St. Vincent, and then later sent by him to the Royal Danish American Gazette on St. Croix, where it was published. It's a long letter. I'm only reading excerpts, but what you will see in this is the true strength of Alexander Hamilton's rhetorical skills first presenting themselves at this level. Remember, this is a 15-year-old boy. This, is, this letter I am reading is from St. Croix, September 6, 1772. Even here in 2018, a 15-year-old writing a letter of this quality, an essay of this quality, if you will, um, in high school would be certainly seen as someone with immense talent who was going to go on to a very substantial and successful life. Honored sir, I take up my pen just to give you an imperfect account of one of the most dreadful hurricanes that memory or any records whatever can trace, which happened here on the 31st Ultimo at night. 
Good God, what horror and destruction. It's impossible for me to describe or you to form an idea of it. It seemed as if the total dissolution of nature was taking place. The roaring of the sea and wind, fiery meteors flying about in the air, the prodigious glare of almost perpetual lighting, the crash of the falling houses and the ear-piercing shrieks of the distressed was sufficient to strike astonishment into angels. Our distressed, helpless condition taught us humility and contempt of ourselves. The horrors of the night, the prospect of an immediate cruel death, or as you may say, of being crushed by the Almighty in his anger, filled us with terror. And everything that had tended to weaken our interest with him upbraided us in the strongest colors with our baseness and folly. That which, in a calm, unruffled temper, we call a natural cause, seemed then like the correction of the deity. Our imagination represented him as an incensed master, executing vengeance on the crimes of his servants. The father and benefactor were forgot, and in that view a consciousness of our guilt filled us with despair. I am afraid, sir, you will think this description more the effort of imagination than a true picture of realities. But I can affirm with the greatest truth that there is not a single circumstance touched upon which I have not absolutely been an eyewitness to. This is Alexander Hamilton at 15, and this is just an excerpt from a much longer letter that displays his prodigious rhetorical skills. Now I switch to New York City. Hamilton, having left St. Croix, first going to school in New Jersey and then coming to New York City. This is another letter. It's a letter written to all of the colonists by Hamilton on December 15th, 1774, as a 17-year-old uh, with revolutionary fervor here in New York City. This was a uh, published, it was a letter published as a pamphlet. Hamilton defended the actions of the First Continental Congress at Philadelphia against the accusations of a author who presented himself as A.W. Farmer. Uh, the identity of Farmer was not known at the time that Hamilton wrote his reply, although it's generally assumed that he it was a, one of the Anglican ministers most likely associated with Trinity Wall Street, who were among the most articulate uh, British loyalists. So this is the letter uh, titled A Full Vindication of the Measures of Congress in New York, December 15, 1774 excerpts here. Friends and countrymen, and first let me ask these restless spirits, whence arises that violent antipathy that seems to entertain not only to the natural rights of mankind, but to common sense and common modesty, that they are enemies to the natural rights of of mankind is manifest, he's talking about the British, because they wish to see one part of their species enslaved by another, that they have an invincible aversion to common sense is apparent in many respects. They endeavor to persuade us that the absolute sovereignty of parliament does not imply our absolute slavery that it is a Christian duty to submit to be plundered of all we have, merely because some of our fellow subjects are wicked enough to require it of us, that slavery, so far from being a great evil, is a great blessing, and even that our contest with Britain is founded entirely upon the petty duty of three pence per pound of East India tea 
Whereas the whole world knows, it is built upon this interesting question, whether the inhabitants of Great Britain have a right to dispose of the lives and property of the inhabitants of America or not. A little consideration will convince us that the Congress, instead of having ignorantly misunderstood, carelessly neglected, or basely betrayed the interest of the colonies, have, on the contrary, devised and recommended the only effective means to secure the freedom and establish the future prosperity of America upon a solid basis. This next letter is from Alexander Hamilton to John Jay, an American statesman, a patriot, a diplomat, and another of the founding fathers, written by Hamilton, November 26, 1775, in New York City. What you'll find in the excerpts from this letter is the quality and the fairness and the leadership qualities of Hamilton in that he looks upon situations in a very clear, responsive way that some of the colonists certainly did not. Dear Sir, you will probably, err this reaches you, have heard of the late incursion made into this city by a number of horsemen from New England under the command of Captain Sears, who took away Mr. Riverton's type and a quartu or two. Though I am fully sensible how dangerous and pernicious Rivington's press has been, and how detestable the character of the man in every respect, yet I cannot help disapproving and condemning this step. In times of such commotion as the present, while the passions of men are worked up to an uncommon pitch, there is great danger of fatal extremes. The same state of of the passions which fits the multitude, who have not a sufficient stock of reason and knowledge to guide them. For opposition to tyranny and oppression very naturally leads them to a contempt and disrespect of all authority. The due medium is hardly to be found among the more intelligent. It is almost impossible among the unthinking populace. When the minds of these are loosened from their attachment to ancient establishment and courses, they seem to grow giddy and are apt more or less to run into anarchy. The next letter, also from the Revolutionary Period, is from Alexander Hamilton to George Washington, written in Albany, November 6, 1777. This is at the point where Hamilton has become an aide, a very important aide-de-camp to Washington. And Washington, this is uh, indicative of the kind of missions, very important missions, that Hamilton was sent on by George Washington at critical points in the war. Washington having complete confidence in Alexander Hamilton, more so than many others that surrounded Washington. Also reflected in this letter, portion of the letter, which I am going to read, um, displays the contempt which Hamilton had for a General Gates. This is Hamilton to Washington. Dear Sir, I arrived here yesterday at noon and waited upon General Gates immediately on the business of my mission but was sorry to find his ideas did not correspond with yours for drawing off the number of troops you directed. I used every argument in my power to convince him of the propriety of the measure, but he was inflexible in the opinion that two brigades at least of Continental troops should remain in and near this place. His reasons were that the intelligence of Sir Harry Clinton's having gone to join Burgoyne was not sufficiently authenticated to put it out of doubt. That there was therefore a possibility of his returning up the river which might expose the finest arsenal in America, as he calls the one here, to destruction should this place be left so bare of troops as I proposed. And that the want of 
convenience and the difficulty of the roads would make it impossible to remove the artillery and stores here for a considerable time, that the New England states would be left open to the de deprivations and ravages of the enemy, that it would be put out of his power to enterprise anything against Ticonderoga, which he thinks might be done in the winter, and which he considers it of importance to undertake. The force of these reasons did by no means strike me, and I did everything in my power to show they were unsubstantial. But all I could effect was to have one brigade dispatched in addition to these already marched. I found myself infinitely embarrassed and was at a loss how to act. I felt the importance of strengthening you as much as possible, but on the other hand, I found insuperable inconsistency Consistencies in acting diametrically opposite to the opinion of a gentleman whose successes have raised him into the highest importance. General Gates has now won the entire confidence of the eastern states. Next is another letter from Hamilton to John Jay, this written in Middlebrook, New Jersey, March 14, 1779. What's important with this letter is the subject matter, which so well reflects Hamilton's aversion to slavery um, in a most useful context here. Um, it, it references Hamilton's very, very good friend, uh, John Lawrence, who had been sent on a mission to South Carolina. Dear sir, Colonel Lawrence, who will have the honor of delivering you this letter, is on his way to South Carolina on a project which I think, in the present situations of affairs there, is a very good one and deserves every kind of support and encouragement. This is to raise two, three, or four battalions of Negroes with the assistance of the government of that state by contributions from the owners in proportion to the numbers they possess. If you should think this proper to enter upon the subject with him, he will give you a detail of his plan. He wishes to have it recommended by Congress to the state and as an inducement that they would engage to take those battalions into continental pay. It appears to me that an expedient of this kind in the present state of Southern affairs is the most rational that can be adopted and promises very important advantages. Indeed, I hardly see how a sufficient force can be collected in that quarter without it, and the enemy's operations there are growing infinitely serious and formidable. I have not the least doubt that the Negroes will make very excellent soldiers with proper management, and I will venture to pronounce that they cannot be put in better hands than those of Mr. Lawrence. He has all the zeal, intelligence, enterprise, and every other qualification requisite to succeed in such an undertaking. Next, I go later into that letter. I foresee that this project will have to combat much opposition from prejudice and self-interest. The contempt we have been taught to entertain for the blacks makes us fancy many things that are founded neither in reason nor experience, and an unwillingness to part with property of so valuable a kind will furnish a thousand arguments to show the impracticability or pernicious tendency of a scheme which requires such a sacrifice. But it should be considered that if we do not make use of them in this way, the enemy probably will, and that the best way to counteract the temptations they will hold out will be to offer them ourselves. An essential part of the plan is to give them their freedom with their muskets. This will secure the fidelity animate their courage, and I believe will have a good influence upon those who remain 
by opening a door to their emancipation. This circumstance, I confess, has no small weight in inducing me to wish the success of the project. For the dictates of humanity and true policy equally interest me in favor of this unfortunate class of men. This next letter is written by Hamilton directly to his very good friend, Lieutenant Colonel John Lawrence, uh, written by Hamilton from headquarters in Middlebrook, New Jersey, April 1779. I read the first part of the letter, and then I go to a latter part of this letter to show an interesting contrast between the sentiments expressed. As far as the sentiments expressed in the first part of this letter, they may not, or they may reflect, the sensibilities we would apply to these comments in the 21st century. Take them either way as you wish. Um, they, there are pa certainly a powerful expression of Hamilton's feelings for Lawrence, whether in a different context than we would apply to them today or not. To Lieutenant Colonel John Lawrence. Cold in my professions, warm in my friendships, I wish, my dear Lawrence, if it were in my power by action rather than words to convince you that I love you. I shall only tell you that till you bade us adieu, I hardly knew the value you had taught my heart to set upon you. Indeed, my friend, it was not well done. You know the opinion I entertain of mankind and how much it is my desire to preserve myself free from particular attachments and to keep my happiness independent on the caprice of others. You should not have taken advantage of my sensibility to steal into my affections without my consent. But as you have done it, and as we are generally indulgent to those we love, I shall not scruple to pardon the fraud you have committed on condition that for my sake, if not for your own, you will always continue to merit the partiality which you have so artfully instilled in to me. Now, later in the same letter. And now, my dear, as we are upon the subject of wife, I empower you and command you to get me one in Carolina. Such a wife as I want will, I know, be difficult to be found, but if you succeed, it will be the strongest proof of your zeal and dexterity. Take her description. She must be young, handsome, I lay most stress upon a good shape, sensible, a little learning will do, well-bred, but she must have an aversion to the word tan. Chaste and tender, I am an enthusiast in my notions of fidelity and fondness of some good nature, a great deal of generosity. She must neither love money nor scolding. In politics, I am indifferent to what side she may be of. I think I have arguments that will easily convert her to mine. This next letter is from Hamilton to James Duane. Duane was an American lawyer. He was a revolutionary leader from New York City. He served as a delegate to the Continental Congress, a New York State Senator, and also became mayor of New York City. Um, I chose this letter written by Hamilton in Liberty Pole, New Jersey, on September 3rd, 1780, because it's indicative of how deeply Hamilton was thinking and writing about in many communications about the future of the country uh, even during and while the Revolutionary War was still taking place. I read a brief opening, and then I go many, many pages later to a reference he makes to uh, financial issues as, as a way of showing 
how he was reflecting a, a view and an understanding that would later lead to his appointment as Secretary of the Treasury. Dear Sir, agreeable to your request and my promise, I sit down to give you my ideas of the defects of our present system and the changes necessary to save us from ruin. They may perhaps be the reveries of a projector rather than the sober views of a politician. You will judge of them and make what use you please of them. The fundamental defect is a want of power in Congress. It is hardly worthwhile to show in which this consists, as it seems to be universally acknowledged, or to point out how it has happened, as the only question is how to remedy it. Again, many, many pages later, after he discusses all aspects of government failure uh, by the Continental Congress and remedies, he deals with the issue of credit. Paper credit never was long supported in any country on a national scale, where it was not founded on the joint basis of public and private credit. An attempt to establish it on public credit alone in France under the auspices of Mr. Law had nearly ruined the kingdom. We have seen the effects of it in America, and every successive experiment proves the futility of the attempt. Our new money is depreciating almost as fast as the old, though it has in some states as real funds as paper money ever had. The reason is that the moneyed men have not an immediate interest to uphold its credit. They may even in many ways find it in their interest to undermine it. The only certain matter to obtain a permanent paper credit is to engage the moneyed interest immediately in it by making them contribute the whole or part of the stock and giving them the whole or part of the profits. This interesting letter is from Alexander Hamilton to Elizabeth Schuyler, soon to become Elizabeth Schuyler Hamilton, written by Hamilton from Tappan, New York on October 2nd, 1780. Uh, keep that date in mind in reference to the next letter and also a brief reference in this letter to who Hamilton refers to as Andre. This was major... John Andre of the uh, British Army, who was involved with Benedict Arnold's treason, and Andre was caught by the Americans leaving um, Arnold and was executed on October 2nd, 1780. Um, Hamilton, at the same time, had a high regard for Andre, and that is why this reference to Andre in this letter. This is a fairly brief letter, and I'm going to read all of it. To Elizabeth Schuyler, I fear you will admire the picture so much as to forget the painter. I wished myself possessed of Andre's accomplishments for your sake, for I would wish to charm you in every sense. You cannot conceive my avidity for everything that would endear me more to you. I shall never be satisfied with giving you pleasure, and I am mortified that I do not unite in myself every valuable and agreeable qualification. I do not my love affect modestly. I am conscious of the advantages I possess. I know I have talents and a good heart, but why am I not handsome? Why have I not every accoutrement that can embellish human naturum? Why have I not fortune that I might hereafter have more leisure than I shall have to cultivate those improvements for which I am not entirely unfit? I am in very good health and shall be in very good spirits when I meet my Betsy. Adieu. This letter, which I read somewhat extensively from, is Alexander Hamilton writing once again to John Lawrence 
at Preakness, New Jersey, October 11th, 1780. This is in reference to uh, John Andre's execution about a week earlier. Um, Hamilton was involved in that situation, was there. And I chose this letter in terms of how he references um, eloquently the, the, the issue, um, talks about Andre, who Lawrence was also very fond of in a certain way because of his style. And then I also switched to the end of the letter where, where Hamilton brings up a related but a different aspect of the story. All right, Hamilton to Lawrence. Since my return from Hartford, my dear Lawrence, my mind has been too little at ease to permit me to write to you sooner. It has been wholly occupied by the affecting and tragic circumstances of Arnold's treason. My feelings were never put to so severe a trial. You will no doubt have heard the principal facts before this reaches you, but there are particulars to which my situation gave me access that cannot have come to your knowledge from public report, which I am persuaded you will find interesting. When his sentence was announced to him, meaning Andre, he remarked, since it was his lot to die, there was still a choice in the mode with which would make a material difference to his feelings, and he would be happy, if possible, to be indulged with a professional death. He made a second application by letter in concise but persuasive terms. It was thought this indulgence being incompatible with the customs of war could not be granted, and it was therefore determined in both cases to evade an answer to spare him the sensations which a certain knowledge of the intended mode would inflict. He asked to be shot by a firing squad rather than to be hanged, which was considered the most insulting and embarrassing way to meet one's fate. Back to the letter. In going to the place of execution, he, again meaning Andre, bowed familiarly as he went along to all those with whom he had been acquainted in his confinement. A smile of complacency expressed the sense of fortitude of his mind. Arriving at the fatal spot, he asked with some emotion, must I then die in this manner? He was told it had been unavoidable. I am reconciled to my fate, said he, but not to the mode. Soon, however, recollecting himself, he added, it will be but a momentary pang, and springing upon the cart, performed the last offices to himself with a composure that excited the admiration and melted the hearts of the beholders. Upon being told the final moment was at hand, and asked if he had anything to say, he answered, nothing, but to request you will witness to the world that I die like a brave man. Among the extraordinary circumstances that attended him in the midst of his enemies, he died universally esteemed and universally regretted. Now, I'm, I'm switching to the very end of the letter where he references Andre's captors. To his conduct, that of the captors of Andre form a striking contrast. He tempted them with the offer of his watch, his horse, and any sum of money they should name. They rejected his offers with indignation and the gold that could seduce a man high in the esteem and confidence of his country, who had the remembrance of past exploits, the motive of present reputation and future glory to cloak his integrity, had no charm for these three simple penitents, leaning only on their virtue and an honest sense of their duty. While Arnold is handed down with excruciation to future times, Posterity will repeat with reverence the names of Van Wert, Paulding, and Williams. Those were the captors. One more 
letter from Hamilton to Elizabeth Schuyler in his courtship of her as their marriage grows closer. This written Preakness, New Jersey, October 13th, 1780. Uh, another example of his stylistic eloquence in every situation, no matter at what level and in what range it occurred. I would not have you imagine, miss, that I write to you so often either to gratify your wishes or to please your vanity, but merely to indulge myself and to comply with that restless propensity of my mind which will not allow me to be happy when I am not doing something in which you are concerned. This may seem a very idle disposition in a philosopher and a soldier, but I can plead illustrious examples in my justification. Achilles had liked to have sacrificed Greece and his glory to his passion for a female captive, and Anthony lost the world for a woman. I am sorry the times are so changed as to oblige me to summons antiquity for my apology, but I confess to the distress of the present age that I have not been able to find many who are as far gone as myself in such laudable zeal for the fair sex. Next is early the following year, um, Alexander Hamilton to Philip Schuyler, Elizabeth Schuyler Hamilton's father, written from headquarters, New Windsor, New York, February 18th, 1781. In this letter, Hamilton explains his famous breakup as aide-de-camp with General George Washington. My dear sir, since I had the pleasure of writing you last, an unexpected change has taken place in my situation. I am no longer a member of the general's family. This information will surprise you. Two days ago, the general told me he wanted to speak to me. I answered that I would wait upon him immediately. I went below and delivered Mr. Tilgman a letter to be sent the commissary containing an order of a pressing and interesting nature. Without delaying a moment, returning to the general, I was stopped by the Marquis de Lafayette and we conversed together about a minute on a matter of business. Instead of finding the general as usual in his room, I met him at the head of the stairs where he accosting me in a very angry tone. Colonel Hamilton, said he, you have kept me waiting at the head of the stairs these ten minutes. I must tell you, sir, you treat me with disrespect. I replied without penitentiality, but with decision. I am not conscious of it, sir, but since you have thought it necessary to tell me so, we... Very well, sir. It is your choice, or something to this effect, and we separated. I sincerely believe my absence, which gave so much umbrage, did not last two minutes. I always disliked office of an aide-de-camp as having in it a kind of personal dependence. I refused to serve in this capacity with two major generals at an early period of the war. Infected with enthusiasm of the times, an idea of the general's character, which unfounded, overcame my scruples and induced me to accept his invitation to enter his family. The general is a very honest man. His competitors have slandered him. His popularity has often been essential to the safety of America and is still of great importance to it. These considerations have influenced my past conduct respecting him and will influence my future. I think it is necessary he should be supported. As I cannot think of quitting the army during the war, I have a project of re-entering into the artillery by taking Lieutenant Colonel Forrester's place, who is desirous of retiring on half pay. I have not, however, made up my mind upon this, as I should be obliged to come in the youngest Lieutenant Colonel instead of the eldest, which I have been by nature succession had I remained in the Corps. And at the same time, 
to resume studies relative to the profession which, to avoid inferiority, must be laborious. This next letter, Hamilton to George Washington, is much later, a few years later, March 25, 1783. This is after Hamilton having left as aide-de-camp, also his heroism at the Battle of Yorktown, and this is now almost two years after the victory at Yorktown, and where the Americans have been clearly victorious, and uh, the 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 a few if there are a few British troops remaining in America, um, principally in New York City. This is Hamilton. Um, obviously still in regular communications with Washington, their separation well forgotten, and Hamilton um, discussing with Washington concern about um, how the soldiers had been treated and are continuing to be treated uh, now that the war is at an end. Again, we're seeing the range and the, the leadership that Hamilton expresses in a multitude of different ways. This was written in Philadelphia on March 25th, 1783, Hamilton to Washington. Sir, the enclosed I write more in a public than in a private capacity. Here I write as a citizen zealous for the true happiness of this country, as a soldier who feels what is due to an army which has suffered everything and done much for the safety of America. I sincerely wish ingratitude was not so natural to the human heart as it is. I sincerely wish there were no seeds of it in those who direct the councils of the United States. But while I urge the army to moderation and advise your excellency to take the direction of their discontents and endeavor to confine them within the bounds of duty, I cannot as an honest man conceal from you that I am afraid their distrust have too much foundation. Republican jealousy has in it a principle of hostility to an army whatever be their merits and whatever be their claims to the gratitude of the community. It acknowledges their service with unwillingness and rewards them with reluctance. I see this temper, though smothered with great care, involuntarily breaking out upon too many occasions. I often feel a mortification which it would be impolite to express, that sets my passion at variance with my reason. Too many, I perceive, if they could do it with safety or color, would be glad to elude the just pretensions of the army. I hope that is not the prevailing disposition. But supporting the country, ungrateful, what can the army do? It must submit to its hard fate. To seek redress by its arms would end in ruin. The army would molder to its own weight and for want of the means of keeping together. The soldiery would abandon their officers. There would be no chance of success without having recourse to means that would reverse our revolution. I make these observations not that I imagine your excellency can want motives to continue your influence in the path of moderation, but merely to show why I cannot myself enter into the views of coercion which some gentlemen entertain, for I confess could force avail I should almost wish to see it employed. I have an indifferent opinion of the honesty of this country, and ill foreboding as to its future system. This from Alexander Hamilton to his brother James. I include this again, a, another example of the range of Hamilton's communication skills, no matter the circumstances, no matter the, the issue, no matter the individual who he is addressing. Uh, this to his brother James, written from New York, June 22, 1785. My dear brother, 
I have received your letter of the 31st of May last, which and one other are the only letters I have received from you in many years. I am a little surprised you did not receive one which I wrote to you about six months ago. The situation you describe yourself to be in gives me much pain, and nothing will make me happier than, as far as may be in my power, to contribute to your relief. I will cheerfully pay your draft upon me for fifty pounds sterling, whenever it shall appear. I wish it was in my power to desire you to enlarge the sum, but though my future prospects are of the most flattering kind, my present engagements would render it inconvenient to me to advance you a larger sum. Let me only request of you to exert your industry for a year or two more where you are, and at the end of that time, I promise myself to be able to invite you to a more comfortable settlement in this country. Allow me only to give you one caution, which is to avoid, if possible, getting in debt. Are you married or single? If the latter, it is my wish for many reasons it may be agreeable to you to continue in that state. But what has happened to our dear father? It is an age since I have heard from him or of him, though I have written him several letters. Another letter from Alexander Hamilton to George Washington. This from New York on September 1788. This is after the successful Constitutional Convention. We are on the cusp of the creation of the United States of America under the Constitution with its first capital in New York City. Here, Hamilton, we see Hamilton expressing the strength of his influence on Washington and, and Hamilton making sure that the single most important first decision awaiting the new nation under the Constitution take place. Dear Sir, I should be deeply pained, my dear Sir, if your scruples in regard to a certain station should be matured into a resolution to decline it. Though I am neither surprised at their existence, nor can I but agree in opinion that the caution you observe in deferring an ultimate determination is prudent. I have, however, reflected maturely on the subject and have come to a conclusion, to which I feel no hesitation, that every public and personal consideration will demand from you an acquiescence in which you will certainly be the unanimous wish of your country. The absolute retreat which you mediated at the close of the last war was natural and proper. Had the government produced by the revolution gone on in a tolerable train, it would have been most advisable to have persisted in that retreat. But I am clearly of opinion that the crisis which brought you again into public view left you no alternative but to comply. And I am equally clear in the opinion that you are, by that act, pledged to take a part in the execution of the government. I am not less convinced that the impression of this necessity of your filling the station in question is so universal that you run no risk of any uncandid imputation by submitting to it. But even if this were not the case, a regard to your own reputation as well as to the public good calls upon you in the strongest manner to run the risk. It cannot be considered as a compliment to say that on your acceptance of the office of president, the success of the new government in its commencement may materially depend. Your agency and influence will be not less important in preserving it from the future attacks of its enemies than they have been in recommending it in the first instance to the adoption of the people. 
independent of all considerations drawn from this source, the point of light in which you stand at home and abroad will make an infinite difference in the respectability with which the government will begin its operation in the alternative of your being or not being at the head of it. This is Alexander Hamilton to James Wilson. James Wilson was a, another immigrant. He was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He was a member of the Constitutional Convention and an early Congress member among many other titles that he held. I include this letter uh, written by Hamilton in New York, January 25th, 1789, just as the government is beginning to arrive and begin to operate in New York City and prior to uh, Washington being sworn in um, as the first president. Again, we're seeing the central role that Hamilton is playing in everything. Here, his concerns about the presidency and also his understanding of a basic floor in the Constitution that has been approved. My dear sir, a degree of anxiety about a matter of primary importance to the new government induces me to trouble you with this letter. I mean the election of the president. We all feel of how much moment it is that Washington should be the man, and I own I cannot think there is material room to doubt that this will be the unanimous sense. But as a failure of this object would be attended with the worst consequences, I cannot help concluding that even possibilities should be guarded against. Everybody is aware of that defect in the Constitution which renders it possible that the man intended for vice president may turn up president. Everybody sees this unanimity in Adams as vice president, and a few votes insidiously withheld from Washington might substitute the former to the latter. And everybody must perceive that there is something to fear from machinations of anti-federal malignancy. What in this situation is wise? This next letter that I include in my collection is from three and a half years later. It is the only letter in the collection who the recipient is not known, but it's validated and it will is found in Founders Online. I have included this letter for one reason, written in Philadelphia on September 26, 1792, because it substantiates Hamilton's concerns about Burr back in 1792. This is... Uh, 12 years before the duel and Burr's murder of Hamilton, all right? This was not a new development in terms of Hamilton's awareness and concerns about Burr, although on a certain level, it would seem to have developed late. I mean, in this period after 1792, both there was a time when both Burr and, and Hamilton were practicing lawyers here in New York City in Lower Manhattan, and they were involved together um, in various matters. But it did not negate Hamilton's feelings as expressed in this letter written in Philadelphia, September 26, 1792, of which I will just read a fairly small portion. Though in my situation I deem it most proper to avoid interference in any matter related to the election for members of government, yet I feel reasons of sufficient force to induce a departure from the rule in the present instance. Mr. Burr's integrity as an individual is not unimpeached. As a public man, he is one of the worst sort a friend to nothing but as it suits his interest and ambition, determined to climb to the highest honors of state and as much higher as circumstances may permit. He cares nothing about the means of effecting his purpose. Tis evidence that he aims at putting himself at the head of what he calls the popular party, as affording the best tool for an ambitious man to work with, secretly turning liberty into ridicule, he, 
knows as well as most men how to make use of the name. In a word, if we have an embryo Caesar in the United States, tis burr. I include this letter from Alexander Hamilton to Charles Pickney, who was a early American statesman from South Carolina, a Revolutionary War veteran, and a delegate to the Constitutional Convention. Uh, in particular, this letter is included because of where the lecture took place. This letter was written by Hamilton right at the Grange, and it also expresses some um, important views of how, at this point, on December 29th, 1802, uh, Hamilton is viewing things in general. My dear sir, a garden, you know, is a very useful refuge of a disappointed politician. Accordingly, I have purchased a few acres about nine miles from town, have built a house, and am cultivating a garden. The melons in your country are very fine. Will you have the goodness to send me some seed, both of the water and musk melons? My daughter adds another request, which is for three or four of your paraquets. She is very fond of birds. If there is anything in this quarter, the sending of which can give you pleasure, you have only to name it. As farmers, a new source of sympathy has risen between us, and I am pleased with everything in which our liking and taste can be approximated. This letter from Alexander Hamilton to Timothy Pickering. Pickering was a politician from Massachusetts. He served a variety of roles. Most notably, he was the third United States Secretary of State under President Washington and then John Adams. In this letter, Hamilton basically defends himself against uh, contentions that he was a monarchist, that he wanted a president for life. I thought it an important issue to cover in the range of letters that I included. From Alexander Hamilton to Timothy Pickering, New York, September 16, 1803. My dear sir, the highest tone proposition which I made in the convention was for a president, senate, and judges during good behavior, a house of representative for three years. Though I would have enlarged the legislative power of the general government, yet I never contemplated the abolition of state governments, but on the contrary, they were constituent parts of my plan. This plan was in my conception comfortable with the strict theory of a government purely Republican, the essential criteria of which are that the principal organs of the executive and legislative departments be elected by the people and hold their offices by a responsible and temporary tenure. I may truly then say that I never proposed either a president or a senate for life, and that I neither recommended nor mediated the annihilation of the state governments. Accordingly, it is a fact that my final opinion was against an executive during good behavior on account of the increased danger to the public tranquility incident to the election of a magistrate to this degree of permanency. In the plan of a constitution which I drew up while the convention was sitting and which I communicated to Mr. Madison about the close of it, Perhaps a day or two after, the office of president has no greater duration than for three years. Very truly, A. Hamilton. As we are now in the last year of Hamilton's life, here is a, another letter from Hamilton to his wife, Eliza, dated 14th October 1803. He in New York, she at the Grange, it, it shows the amount of interest he had in this new home of his and his family's, the Grange, and the level of detail he brought to that project. My dear Eliza, there are some things necessary to be done which I admitted mentioning to you. I wish the carpenters to make and insert two chimneys for ventilating the ice house, 
each about two feet square and four feet long, half above and half below the ground, to have a cap on the top sloping downwards so that the rain may not easily enter. The aperture for letting in and out the air to be about a foot and a half square in the side immediately below the cap. Let a separate compost bed be formed near the present one to consist of three barrels full of the clay which I bought, six barrels of black mold, two wagon loads of the best clay on the hill opposite the Quaker's place, this side of Mrs. Verdplank's. The gardener must go for it himself and one wagon load of pure cow dung. Let these be well and repeatedly mixed and pounded together to be made use of hereafter for the vines. You see, I do not forget the grange. No, that I do not, nor any one that inhabits it. Accept yourself my tenderest affections. Give my love to your children and remember me to Cornelia. Adieu, my darling. As we near the end of my presentation and also Hamilton's life, I make one exception to the fact that all the other letters are from Hamilton to others. I'm including here the brief letter from Aaron Burr to Hamilton that set the stage for the duel shortly after this point in which Burr murders Hamilton. This is from Burr to Hamilton, New York City, 18 June, 1804. Sir, I send for your perusal a letter signed by Charles D. Cooper, which, though apparently published some time ago, has but very recently come to my knowledge. Mr. Van Ness, who does me the favor to deliver this, will point out to you that clause of the letter to which I particularly request your attention. You might perceive, sir, the necessity of a prompt and unqualified acknowledgement or denial of the use of any expressions which could warrant the assertions of Dr. Cooper. I have the honor to be your obedient servant, A. Burr. Now we have Hamilton's immediate reply to Burr two days later on June 20th, 1804. It's a lengthier letter in which Hamilton demolishes the logic of Burr's letter and Burr's credibility. But of course, although I do not include them, there are further exchanges between them which inevitably lead to the confrontation on July the 11th, 1804. Again, Hamilton's response to Burr. Sir, I have maturely reflected on the subject of your letter of the 18th instant. And the more I have reflected, the more I have become convinced that I could not, without manifest impropriety, make the avowal or disavowal which you seem to think necessary. The language of Dr. Cooper's plainly implies that he considered this opinion of you, which he attributes to me, as a despicable one. But he affirms that I have expressed some others still more despicable, without, however, mentioning to whom, when, or where. Tis evidence that the phrase, still more despicable, admits of infinite shades from very light to very dark. How am I to judge of the degree intended? Or how shall I annex any precise idea to language so indefinite? What precise inference could you draw as a guide for your future conduct were I to acknowledge that I had expressed an opinion of you still more despicable than the one which is particularized? How could you be sure that even this opinion had exceeded the bounds which you would yourself deem admissible between political opponents? But I forbear further comment on the embarrassment to which the requisition you have made actually leads. The occasion forbids a more ample illustration, though nothing would be more easy than to pursue it. 
repeating that I cannot reconcile it with propriety to make the acknowledgement or denial you desire. I will add that I deem it inadmissible on principle to consent to be interrogated as to the justness of the inferences which may be drawn by others from whatever I may have said of a political opponent in the course of a 15-year competition. Again, I just want to refer back to the letter I included from Hamilton from 1792. Back to the end of this letter. I trust on more reflection you will see the matter in the same light with me. If not, I can only regret the circumstance and must abide the consequences. I have the honor to be, sir, your obedient servant, A. Hamilton. And now to the conclusion of this presentation and even more to the point to Hamilton's life. This is not only the very last letter that Hamilton wrote. This is the very last thing Hamilton ever wrote on this earth. It is, in my view, the single most important letter of Hamilton's life because in it, it makes clear, offers irrefutable evidence that Hamilton had no intention of shooting Burr that if it came to it, he would allow himself to be murdered by Burr rather than he shoot Burr. This is a brief letter. There was a similar letter that Hamilton also authored to Eliza, as this letter is authored to Eliza a few days earlier. But this one is the most powerful at all. And again, reason to consider it the most important letter of Hamilton's the entire life. The second part of this letter is obviously the, the key to it, but the first part also shows, the, the again, even at this point, with Hamilton facing death, he was also, at the same time, thinking about the needs of others. The person who he is speaking to Eliza about is his cousin, a cousin of his who remained still back in the Caribbean. This is the letter from Alexander Hamilton to Elizabeth Hamilton, written from Hamilton in Lower Manhattan on the evening of July 10th, the evening before the duel in Weehawken, New Jersey. My beloved Eliza, Mrs. Mitchell is the person in the world to whom, as a friend, I am under the greatest obligations. I have not hitherto done my duty to her but resolved to repair my omissions as much as possible. I have encouraged her to come to this country and intend, if it shall be in my power, to render the evening of her days comfortable. But if it shall please God to put this out of my power and to enable you here thereafter to be of service to her, I entreat you to do it and to treat her with the tenderness of a sister." The scruples of a Christian have determined to me to expose my own life to an extent rather than subject myself to guilt of taking the life of another. This must increase my hazards and redoubles my pangs for you. But you had rather I should die innocent than live guilty. Heaven can preserve me and I humbly hope will, but in the contrary event, I charge you to remember that you are a Christian. God's will be done. The will of a merciful God must be good. Once more adieu, my darling, darling wife, A.H., Tuesday evening, 10 o'clock.